Welcome. We're going to go ahead and get started. We always try to start uh, a few minutes after the hour just to give folks time to, to get parked and find uh, the location. So I just want to... Hey, good evening, everyone. Welcome. We're going to go ahead and get started. We always try to start uh, a few minutes after the hour just to give folks time to, to get parked and find uh, the location. So I just want to thank you so much for coming out tonight. Uh, we're back uh, in person. I know it's been last years, you know, we've not been uh, meeting in person very regularly, but I I'm, I kind of felt like tonight may be the beginning of uh, us meeting again on a regular basis in person, but we'll continue to do some virtual ones as well, and ideally we'll start doing these where if we do it in person, we'll also try to Zoom it at the same time just to allow folks uh, both, uh, both opportunities, and we're going to be recording tonight, and so just be aware of that, um, and so... Uh, I want to introduce myself. I know some of you may not know who I am. I'm Chad Cooper. I am uh, the Executive Director of Sustainable Sanctuary Coalition. We're one of the sponsors tonight, and I want to thank you for coming out. And if you don't know who Sustainable Sanctuary is, we're an interfaith environmental organization uh, that was really founded out of Village Church and uh, is a multi-faith, if you will, too. Um, uh, working with folks from different faith traditions to uh, try to, to encourage people of faith to be more sustainable and to care for creation. Uh, Josh is a fifth generation farm boy. He was talking a little farming before you all arrived about uh, his, his farm and cattle and that sort of thing. He married a fifth generation city girl in May 2007 at Village Church where she grew up and remains a member. He and Kimberly own and operate a, uh, three state farms, a diversified crop and livestock operation and they were raising their four young children there. From 2003 to 2009, he served in the Kansas legislature. For five years, he was the ranking minority member of the House Agriculture and uh, Natural Resource Committee. He served on the House uh, Utilities Committee. During the Parkinson administration, he served as Kansas Secretary of Agriculture. Josh has been the senior advisor at the Environmental Protection Agency Region 7 in uh, KC and the vice president of the Land Institute. He currently farms and manages his consulting company, Perennial Prairie. In May 2017, he entered the Kansas primary as a Democratic candidate for governor. This will be Josh's eighth presentation at Village. And so I'm sure he has more to share, but I just wanted to, to give that uh, a bio for you all in case you didn't read it. So without further ado, let's welcome Josh. Well, it is a pleasure to be back here. I, I will give you a task as we get started. I brought my satchel in with me, and I can remember all sorts of facts and figures, but I generally walk out of every event and leave this behind, so somebody <laughs> yell at me if you see me walking out without something tonight. Uh, that, is, that is for me to take home with me. Everything is in there. Uh, other thing I would mention, yes, uh, my wife is the true Kansas Cityan, and I think even Chick might be involved in this, but. Her, uh, we are all going to be back here on April 13th. Uh, cool story about her family. Her great-grandfather was the legendary coach at Southwest High, L.A. House, uh, if you are familiar with. Uh, and, and he was so popular that when he died unexpectedly in 1955, Harry Truman uh, took some of the marble that was from the original White House uh, and they have a statue, or not a statue, but they have a plaque, and a ba the base there is at Southwest is made out of that marble from the White House. So I think they're going to rededicate all of that, similar to everything else at Southwest High, is kind of falling down. So I think they're going to rededicate it and put in a new plaque for him on the 13th of April. So the whole family is reconvening back there again, uh, which is a lot of fun for us. And, and I always tease my mother-in-law. She knows more about football than anyone else in the family, and I think it's genetics. And so I've been on a long-term tear to get her to be the next head football coach at KU, because they tend to, every other year they're looking for a new one. I think they have a good one now, so you know they uh, maybe don't have as much of an interest. But uh, anyway, my, yeah, my family, my wife's family is very connected to, uh, to Kansas City and have been here a long time. So this is a really interesting topic uh, when Jerry reached out and said, you know, do you want to talk about this? And I said, you know, I could maybe choreograph an interpretive dance about these two, but I guess I could also just do a talk if that'd be easier. Uh, but I will say up front, I am not an expert on both the Inflation Reduction Act and the Farm Bill. 
Uh, but I would also argue that I'm not sure anyone is an expert on both of these. These are really, yeah, these are really big pieces of legislation. They're huge. In fact, Jerry's probably seen my slides. I think I've got like 40 slides. 38 of them are on the Inflation Reduction Act, and there's only two on the Farm Bill, and one of them's a picture. Uh, and when we get there, I'll explain why. But these are really complicated pieces of federal legislation. And I'll start by saying uh, that they're not the only big bills out there. So to understand, no surprise, uh, Congress tends to be gridlocked when you have uh, one chamber controlled by one party and the other chamber controlled by the other party. And that's what we have now. Well, prior to having that, you had two parties that were in uh, two chambers controlled by the same party, plus the White House was controlled by that party. And there was a major push to pass several large pieces of legislation. That's not a or shifting this nation when it comes to <laughs> energy, infrastructure, and climate. And so I have this up here just so that you understand. Before we even talk about the Inflation Reduction Act, you have the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the IIJA, and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, the bill. And that's, you're not reading that wrong, $1.2 trillion coming into these states. And you know some of them are for bridges, and some of them are for broadband deployment, so they're not directly connected to climate. Uh, but some of that money is going to go to energy infrastructure, transmission upgrades, climate upgrades. And so the IRA and the Farm Bill are not the only gigantic spending bills out there that are going to change the landscape over the next couple of years. So don't forget the IIJA and then Bill. But we go to the Infl Inflation Reduction Act. So the IRA not the Irish Republican Army, uh, was really the last major piece of legislation that was passed uh, by a, a House and a Senate and a White House that were all controlled by the Democratic Party. Uh, and it's got, I mean, there's, they were, had a number of elements to it. You know, you've got this um, shifting of the IRS and how are we going to pay for it. Uh, but most people don't focus on that. Uh, most people focus on what it was really spending that money on, and that money uh, was going to be spent largely on substantial investments in climate-related uh, technology and upgrades nationwide. And so you can kind of see the level of funding that we're talking about, uh, $386 billion total dedicated to energy and climate, uh, and of that you can see the tax credits are a huge portion of that. We'll get into the tax credits later. Uh, you can see the infrastructure around uh, energy and improvements, uh, clean energy incentives, clean manufacturing tax credits, uh, fuel tax credits, conservation. Uh, you can just go straight down here. And I would imagine, where's Jerry? Uh, I mean, you have this now, so if people want to look at this, um, they are welcome to have my slides after this. Sure. Because I almost put this up here because it's, it, it's comical. I mean, you obviously cannot look at this. Uh, but this is what we are talking about when we are saying giant amounts of, in, uh, of investment levels that we've never seen before in the areas that groups like us, and I say us because some of you, I've now been seeing you for like eight to 10 years or longer because we come and <laughs> gather here from time to time, and we've talked about these things forever. You guys have been having electric car get-togethers in the parking lot way before it was a thing, and now there are absurd incentives to drive the expansion of electric cars in this country. So I, you know, I'm just pulling this out. Battery materials processing grants, $3 billion in the IRA for that. Uh, maintaining and enhancing hydroelectric incentives, $553.6 million. And then this is my favorite thing about this. I call this the, the Ronco um, TV side of doing this presentation. But wait, there's more. <laughs> I mean, this is, I don't, we even swoosh these in. You can't even see all these. All of these, I mean, that's $500 million for watershed and flood prevention operations. Just all sorts of investments, don't worry, I'm not going through each of these individually, uh, but you get a sense of the amount of money uh, being driven toward 
uh, the programs that we have talked about for a long, long time. And so uh, you can just see uh, why I am not an expert and no one right now is a complete expert on what all of this is because we don't entirely know yet. Uh, the, we still haven't in, entirely decided how all of this is going to be exactly spent. The way the federal government operates is when they have a big bill like this, then they open it up to public comments. Uh, those comments on guideline suggestions were due at the end of 2022. Those have been put in place. Uh, those went to the Department of Treasury because it's largely going to be the Department of Treasury uh, Secretary Janet Yellen, who decides the guidelines of how we're going to spend that, but they've not issued those guidelines yet. So we know ballpark numbers, but we don't know exactly what the rules are going to be on uh, how these guidelines are going to work on the IRA funding levels moving forward. So from that, I'm going to talk about the major winners in uh, the IRA, and we could devote an entire night to hydrogen if you want to. Uh, I don't. I'm. I don't want to do that. My <laughs> wife is uh, very involved in Kansas's uh, application to be a hydrogen hub. But if you're not, if this is the very first time in your entire life you've ever heard of hydrogen, uh, <laughs> let me give you a 30-second blip. It is a gas. It can burn. Uh, the uh, tragic accident associated with the Hindenburg is probably the most famous incident of it burning when it was not supposed to. I use that as an example because there are moments in history where things happen and then suddenly we're like, well, we're never doing that again. Well, the Hindenburg happened and we're like, we are never dealing with hydrogen again. Guess what? All gases that are flammable can be flammable and, and cause bad things. Gasoline is also very flammable. Uh, but we very much stepped away from hydrogen at that point and didn't use it. A similar incident after Chernobyl and Three Mile Island, shortly thereafter, we did not build any more nuclear facilities in this country. So we have a history of reacting when bad things happen. That's not a bad thing, uh, but this country in the 1930s moved away from hydrogen. We are now looking at it again for a variety of reasons. One, it's very clean burning. Two, you can produce it through electrolysis and use electricity to make hydrogen, and that's one of the reasons that the federal government is incenting it uh, so significantly, because as we've shifted to renewable energy, renewable energy is intermittent. Uh, wind turbines produce a lot of power when the wind is blowing, and we want that to be happening when we need that power the most, but they also produce a lot of power sometimes when we don't need it, in the middle of the night. And so sometimes, you'll go ahead. Just a clarification question, doesn't hydrolysis take more electricity than it produces in hydrogen gas? Yes, so the, 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 problem, right? the, the question is, does electrolysis, is the energy input worth the energy output? And uh, there are a variety of answers. It depends on what you do with the hydrogen, you could say. Uh, but I think this is also a classic case of the federal government trying to solve a problem and maybe maybe they may have pushed a little too hard. Uh, we need to figure out what to do with excess electricity, particularly at night. Well, hydrogen is a great solution to that because you can produce hydrogen through electrolysis through the middle of the night, uh, and then during the day when you need that power it comes back. That being said, we have seen initial indications that the incentive for hydrogen is so strong, this is a 10-year program, that by year seven, hydrogen will go price negative. Like the, it is that much of a federal incentive to produce hydrogen. Uh, plus there are questions, is it really the best thing to be producing with that uh, excess electricity? It takes a considerable amount of water. And for those of you, and I know uh, many of you in this room have, we've talked about this before, water through broad stretches of this state uh, is something that's not to be casual with. So, but, be that as it may, and my wife and I give this presentation many times, we didn't make the rules, we're just trying to figure them out, and there is a whopping big incentive to produce hydrogen in the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, next big winner, and this is interesting for a discussion of the Sustainable Sanctuaries Committee, uh, the capacity to transfer your tax credits. 
So what used to happen is they would put a tax credit in place for you to put on, say, rooftop solar. Well, that's great if you've got a great big tax appetite, but if you are a church, that doesn't really work for you. Well, they rewrote the way you can transfer those tax credits to make it available for municipalities, for churches, for nonprofits who were not able to take advantage of uh, the benefits of, say, a rooftop solar system. That is significantly easier now. I'm being nebulous because we don't know exactly how easy it is yet because those rules aren't done yet. But it is going to be much easier and that will be a huge game changer for uh, particularly churches that would like to do something bold um, with their energy consumption it will make it so much easier for you to derive the financial benefit that uh, a, an individual homeowner would be able to do um, that's a big change in the inflation reduction act but that would also apply to cities then that's a big deal if you are a municipal utility you have no tax appetite, you're now able to transfer those benefits to uh, another entity. Uh, another big winner, uh, existing nuclear facilities, back to the federal government trying to say, this is where we want to go and how we want to get there. Uh, there is a considerable benefit um, going to the power that's coming off of nuclear facilities. Uh, we only have one nuclear facility in the state of Kansas. You didn't think I was going to put you on the spot here. Anybody know where it is? Burlington, Burlington Wolf Creek. That's right. Uh, and I tell everybody this, don't casually stroll up there. Uh, when I was in the legislature, I came in right after 9-11, and there was a big push for security after 9-11, which is understandable. And they allow you to conceal your security costs uh, from ratepayers, which is also understandable, uh, but they came in with a bill once uh, to take a, um, take away their any liability on a shoot to kill around Wolf Creek <laughs> if you feel like the physical property of Wolf Creek is being threatened, which is a major shift. You can shoot someone if you physically feel threatened yourself anywhere, uh, but they can shoot you if they feel like you're threatening the building. And I can remember, I, that's the only time in a committee I ever recorded my vote no. I was like, I'm uncomfortable with this. There are people that fish uh, in that little cooling reservoir around there, and I would hate for them to accidentally, I mean, there are fences. Uh, but yeah, don't stumble around Wolf Creek. Uh, they can shoot you quite easily. Um, uh, next big winner, obviously, uh, the Treasury and the IRS, and I've been amused just personally that people were so upset that the IRS was talking about hiring new people and some people were like, well, that's a horrible thing. Uh, I actually think it's a great thing because every once in a while, if you ever have trouble with the IRS, you find out it's impossible to talk to any humans. I'm like, if you hire anybody that answers the phone, I'll be a happy person. But uh, that'll be a major shift uh, coming out of the IRA, but that's not one really that, that has as much of a uh, climate impact. Uh, next big winner is sustainable aviation fuel. For those of you that track mobile sources uh, of emissions, we have been working hard on making our cars a lot cleaner uh, for a long time. And, and to the internal combustion engine designers credit, they have actually gotten substantially better for cars. Uh, but we are now seeing a real shift toward electrical ve electric vehicles, which is infinitely better. We are having trouble getting batteries into airplanes, no surprise. And so they are looking at sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, my question broadly is, the devil's always going to be in the details. You know, how do you define a sustainable aviation fuel? I've seen startups that have a hydrogen fuel powered airplane, um, but I also know that the entirety of the Iowa ethanol industry was like, <laughs> pivot, here's the new incentive, let's find a way to make the uh, corn ethanol in Iowa a sustainable aviation fuel. So uh, you're going to see a, a race toward qualifying for these standards uh, to get whatever fuel source you have classified as a sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, so that's a big incentive, and that's another one where I think you're gonna see a transformation over a, a long period of time. Uh, next one, electric vehicle auto dealers. And it is, it's wild, you know, um, 
the number of years I've been involved with this church and then seeing the notices for electric vehicles here back when it was the Prius and that was it. Uh, and now the transformation in this industry plus this huge incentive uh, that is that is coming. There used to be a cap. If this is tiny, but you know you'll have these slides after if you want, if you want to look at them. Used to be a cap on electric vehicle makers, and so once you hit that, uh, the incentive goes <coughs> off of those. The cap's gone, so they can keep applying their credits to their electric vehicles uh, indefinitely now. You know, Tesla had reached that cap; it was no longer there. Ford, I think, had even reached it by now. Well, that's gone. So. That credit will exist and continue going, uh, plus there are other elements um, in, in the electric vehicle uh, one. Then the next big winner are industrial manufacturers. And so there are going to be enormous shifts in changing the way that we make and produce things. I call this the decarbonization of the industrial economy. And it's, it's going to look different, uh, but I find this area incredibly exciting because there are in innovations coming out all the time that are, that are going to improve these processes, and they span the gamut. I work with a company in San Francisco that has invented a process using a lightning arc to make uh, nitric acid, which is a base fertilizer and so it's not even like you probably some of you that are into this have seen things about green ammonia or green hydrogen we would argue this is much better than a green hydrogen because as was mentioned before there it takes a lot of power to make hydrogen uh, and a lot of water as well so whether it's fertilizer but there's another company called via separations that has a, a thermal membrane and I'm still not entirely sure what it does, but it traps the heat produced in a lot of these processes so they're not releasing that heat. I think you're going to see, because of these incentives, large numbers of, of kind of startup technological innovations that we don't even know about yet come on board in the next 10 years. Uh, but this again, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but these are just some of the new concepts that are coming out in the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, and then, you know, these delayed technology neutral credits, uh, and you can see these timelines, and I put this up here as well just because it's important to understand how big the IRA is from the sense of most of the time when the federal government does something, they do it, it's, it's a short-term basis. Uh, the IRA runs 10 years, which in the climate technology world is a lifetime. So you don't have to chase, like when COVID dollars came out, they're like, well, go sign up for a, a COVID bailout and you've got six weeks to do it. And so everyone's scrambling to sign up for your bailout. You don't have to scramble. You can plan. Utilities can plan. Churches can plan. Uh, you can plan on your own at home. And so you don't have to decide, well, gosh, do I want to put on that rooftop solar that I've been putting off? and make the decision before the end of the year, you've got 10 years. Uh, and I would imagine something potentially builds out of this 10 years from now. But you have 10 years to work through this, uh, which makes it infinitely better for everyone. Uh, there is a domestic content bonus credit. Uh, if you build things here, if you access the technology available here, uh, you get an additional credit. Panasonic could not have announced their electric battery production facility on shore at a better time because uh, they were already going to build it here. They now get a substantial incentive uh, for making electric vehicle car batteries here. There's an energy communities bonus credit, and these are communities broadly defined. They could be counties, they could be regions, areas that were historically involved in energy production and the idea behind this is can we incent uh, investments in those areas so that the, the places that may have been, um, you, you'll start to see a theme here, Joe Manchin's behind a lot of these, but like is there a place that historically has produced a lot of coal, these people are now out of work, can we drive some of the investment back in these areas? Uh, we will have 
areas in Kansas that qualify for this. We don't know exactly where those are yet. I've seen some initial maps. They're probably going to be historically oil and gas producing counties in central and western Kansas. Uh, but there could be, uh, um, I'd have to go back and look, I didn't see anything necessarily up around here, but there could be some stuff uh, back in, in, in the eastern portion of the state. I've heard a story about an energy company in Kentucky that was all coal that basically strip mined, you know, the area. Now they're taking the, the destroyed land and putting solar panels on it that is, and getting credit for it. That is exactly what this would end up doing, yes. Uh, now, Southeast Kansas certainly also qualifies. Um, or if you're familiar, I always tell this story to people just because I, I'm obsessed with the state of Kansas. But if you know where Topeka is in Shawnee County, and then you know Osage County just to the south of it, immediately to the south of it, uh, they actually had deep coal mines in Osage County in the 1880s, 90s, and, and the turn of the century. They were the principal supplier of coal to the Santa Fe Railroad uh, mm -hmm. 110 years ago. And now, there's, you know, that's hardly gone, but there are some old Italian populations in Osage County going back to those mining days. Uh, there's a low income communities bonus energy credit for wind and solar, which is exactly what it sounds like, um, you know, designed again to try to drive investment into um, uh, lower income areas. Uh, there's a zero emission nuclear power credit, um, again, trying to drive uh, nuclear energy and I think that they're also very interested in um, these small reactors this is just more again I'm not putting this up so we can go through it tonight I'm just putting it up there so that if you want to access these slides and you are really interested in that clean hydrogen credit um, uh, we've got it there so you can take a look at it and you can see just exactly what um, those are uh, there's a carbon capture credit and back to this fuzzy realm of of people that will take advantage of these, uh, there were strong incentives put in place to um, capture carbon coming off of processes. And to no surprise, this is a huge benefit to the existing oil and gas infrastructure. And so you will see them take advantage of this a lot. Uh, this would be methods that they may use to basically turn that stack and, and put it back down underground. I would argue that um, anytime you start to sequester anything, whether it's CO2 or something else, at scale, uh, uh, interesting things can happen. Um, Kansas knows this very well. When we were taking the wastewater coming off of um, large oil and gas wells down in, in South Central Kansas and then pumping it back underground, Shocker, it lubricated the old um, fault lines down there, and that's what created a new seismicity. I wonder how long we can do this before we start doing things that we did not expect. Um, that being said, that similar to the hydrogen incentive, this is a big incentive. Uh, and you could argue, well, that's great if it, if it uh, takes the CO2 that they're producing out of the atmosphere and puts it somewhere else. It'll just be interesting to see uh, what they end up doing with that. Also, uh, if you follow this, the big debate in Iowa and Nebraska over the power of eminent domain to build carbon or CO2 pipelines. That's what this is about. That CO2 is coming off of ethanol facilities. They want to pipe that CO2 somewhere else and sequester it to get the money from this. And then if they're sequestering it, they can also kind of qualify for sustainable aviation fuel so they want to build a bunch of CO2 pipelines, and that's where this is coming from. Um, and then there's the Advanced Energy Project credit, and, and it's kind of the Joe Manchin Project credit. We're not exactly sure what this does, except we're generally sure who it's going to benefit, and that's our, the energy industry in and around West Virginia. So this was a late addition to the bill, and that was the person behind it. Um, and yeah, again, like we haven't worked through all of this, but it's it was designed for uh, the coal in the uh, coal industry. Uh, now, to individual elements of the IRA, uh, they did want to drive consumer behavior. So there are new energy efficiency home credits uh, that are available. I'm not going to go through these, but you will have the slides afterward. 
um, major uh, incentives to put rooftop solar on your home. Uh, there were some incentives already anyway. They are stronger now, and I think you'll see a proliferation of these, uh, of these systems uh, moving onto the landscape. Uh, and then uh, that's more of the details of the residential clean energy credit. Um, and again, 10 years. So if you are interested in this, you've got lots of time to make the decision and take advantage of the credits that are available going into rooftop solar. Uh, if you are buying a clean, uh, an electric vehicle, all sorts of incentives uh, built around that, not only for the car itself, but also for the charger at home. If you have a company with a lot of uh, delivery vehicles, there's all sorts of incentives for those delivery vehicles to transition your fleet to electric. So um, more of the information on the clean vehicle credits. Uh, there are all sorts of incentives for us to build out the infrastructure necessary to charge electric vehicles. For those of you that have them, uh, this has been a limiting factor for a lot of people. Um, not necessarily that they mind waiting for a long time, but they just want to know that are there going to be lots of charging stations if I take off driving somewhere? The nation wants to uh, drive that infrastructure, and so there's all sorts of money in here for this, but there's even money for this build out in the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law that I mentioned at the very beginning. Uh, more about the clean vehicle credit. There's even a credit for previously owned clean vehicles. So they thought of everything in the IRA, and they are trying to incent consumers to move toward uh, purchasing electric vehicles, whether they're new or used. Um, there are also major assistances about uh, um, changing out uh, windows. There are um, rebates for new windows. There are rebates for new doors. There's rebates for installing um, uh, insulation in your home. Uh, so multiple efforts to make it easier for consumers to uh, make the changes in their homes. There's even incentives for new electric stoves over gas stoves. Yeah, Bill. Just that the, the rebate part is uh, income qualified for lower income. The tax credits are for everybody. The tax credits are for everybody. There are rebates, uh, like I think if you go in and buy a new stove that's up to $800, uh, but that is qualified, and I think I, I, um, I don't want to say the wrong thing, but I think that's generally around. Uh, under, is it under one hundred and fifty thousand dollars per household, or I think it's lower than that. It I might be lower than that. The, something about the median income, and yeah, Jerry. Is, any likelihood the Kansas legislature will be providing some of its own uh, incentives in this area? Uh, the question is, is there any likelihood the Kansas legislature will provide any incentives in this area? Not likely in, uh, I'm, I'm before I answer, um, no except indirectly yes. In the governor's budget this year, there was $220 million designated for <clears throat> matching funds for communities because a lot of the larger infrastructure projects that are associated with this coming from the federal government require some degree of local match and the governor believed that there are communities out there and there are that would be great fits for these federal programs but they can't even put together the 10 or 25 percent match required to take advantage of the federal dollars and so we were setting aside a fund for communities to access so that they could get the matching fund and draw down a lot more uh, federal investment. Um, that bill, or that existence of that fund is literally TBD debated this afternoon. Uh, we don't know. They, Does Mike Thompson support it? <laughs> uh, so, I'm not sure. Um, but I also don't know if, if he's, and I, I don't, uh, this is going to come out sounding bad, but I don't know if he's connected the dots between that $220 million being crucial to helping communities take advantage of, of these, uh, these sorts of things. Uh, if he's watching this at home, he'll probably not support it now. But, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's what that was there for. Um, and then also, yeah, there were uh, uh, light heap, what we call uh, energy assistance programs. So 
glazed eyes. I'm sorry. It takes that much. And I, and I still, I, I mean, you saw the list of, of everything that's in the IRA and how big it is. I call it the hare because when you compare the tortoise and the hare, it's the one moving fast. And we don't even have the guidance out yet on it. Uh, but we are rapidly changing in this country. And there will be large efforts to slow down some of these changes. But in three years, we're going to see substantial changes. Our country was changing to electric vehicles because that's what consumers wanted anyway. And it's going to supercharge that. So in a short amount of time, you're going to see major changes. Yeah. How is it that this $1.2 trillion bill is titled Inflation Reduction? <laughs> yes. So, so the $1.2 trillion was technically the IIJA and the BIL, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the IIJA. This one is only $386 billion. And to oh this one's credit, as opposed to the IIJA and the BIL, which is, um, I'm not sure where those are funded. I think those were, uh, those were very much a response to COVID. We've got to supercharge the economy. And, and, and I, I say this, I don't know where those are funded. So it, I, it's unfair of me, uh, but I'm not sure those were necessarily as funded. This bill, to its credit, was funded through those changes in the IRS. Uh, to more um, more accurately follow where tax dollars were coming from, I think, was what they hoped uh, they would bring in the money uh, by at more adequately uh, working through the IRS. So that one was paid for, and that's around three hundred and eighty six billion dollars. Um, but this is going this is going to move fast. and it's it it feels like it's longer because it's ten years. Uh, than the farm bill, which is done every five years, but it is the hare. The farm <clears throat> bill is the tortoise. And we have had a version of something like a farm bill for uh, around 75 years. The farm bill really got started with, I think this is my next slide. Oh, no, sorry. I, had, I still had more light requirements. That's the uh, income requirements. That yeah, that was the income requirements there, and you can kind of see... Um, on some of the, well, these are the light ones, so these are particularly reduced. Uh, uh, the farm bill really got started uh, with this individual who was a Kansan, um, Bob Dole, at the time uh, in Congress and then became a senator. And he was the one in 1968 that decided to tie uh, the farm programs to nutrition programs and put something together that could be passed in a bipartisan fashion. Uh, again, I'm putting you on the spot here on a Monday night. Who's this? Yeah. 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 There you go. And now I'm going to test my case staters here. Who's that? I'm sorry, who's the one on the right? Oh, this is Nancy yeah. Landon Castle. Yeah. Okay. No takers over there. The, one of the more distinctive figures, although he doesn't have a stubby cigar in his mouth there. That is the esteemed, he just passed away uh, three years ago. Esteemed ag economics professor at K-State, Barry Flinchbaugh. Mm -hmm. And Barry famously had a hand in writing every farm bill because of Bob Dole. So Bob Dole got that going, and then he turned to K-State ag economics, and it was Barry Flinchbaugh. And you want to talk about a character, Barry was very interesting. Uh, but they crafted the modern farm bill, and, and that's why it has the distinctive feel that it has. This is redone every five years. It's got uh, all sorts of things in it. I'm going to go to the next graph. Uh, and it's also generally the size of the um, Inflation Reduction Act. But if you can look at this pie, you can see the bulk of those dollars go to nutrition programs, um, SNAP programs, WIC programs, uh, things that are very important in our communities across the country. And uh, you'll hear people debate this all the time. Oh my gosh, they just keep getting more and more and more into nutrition. Uh, Bob Dole is not here anymore. Barry Flinchbaugh is not here anymore. But both of them would tell any crowd, the most Democratic crowd or the most Republican crowd, they're like, you can't separate the two of these because the moment you separate nutrition out from the farm programs, then you lose your ability to gain the 
uh, bipartisan nature of getting this bill across the floor. Mm -hmm. So this is what's happening uh, in Congress right now. And this is so funny. You saw all my slides about the IRA. Uh, that is absolutely the end of my slideshow on the Farm Bill because <laughs> I'm going to talk politics about the Farm Bill for the rest of the night. So the IRA passed when you had a Democratic House and a Democratic Senate and a Democratic President. And it didn't have to pass at all. It, it was just a bill they thought up, and that's how they got it passed. The Farm Bill has to be reauthorized every five years, no matter who's president, who's running the Senate, who's running the House. And so right now we have a Republican House and a Democratic Senate and a Democratic president, and it is gridlock. And there's talk in D.C. that the only bill they'll pass this year is probably going to be the farm bill because it's the only one they can get across the finish line. So back to this, it takes two, even though the pie looks different, you have to have them both because uh, generally democratic interests are associated around nutrition and then farm bill commodity interests are associated around uh, the Republican Party. That's not 100% the case, but that's generally the case. And as, I'll get you in a second, Dan, but as, as we have become more polarized as a country where all, you know, states are either very blue or very red, that's become more pronounced. And so that's why this ends up looking the way it does. Uh, even then, in the last two weeks, I've now started hearing rumors that we may not get a farm bill by the end of this year. What they'll do is they'll reauthorize the current one, uh, just sort of limp it along until they can get a new farm bill going. But for the purposes of our discussion the e this evening, and then I'll open it up to questions because I don't want to talk the whole time, but uh, I'm not going to talk about this. I'm going to talk in here because we really want to talk about, well, where can we influence change on the landscape from a climate and ag perspective? Well, it's all in here, and you can see, you know, you have crop insurance, which is a huge part of it, uh, commodities, which uh, become very parochial. Your local elected senators care very much about making sure that the commodities that are grown in their states are protected. So in, in Kansas, it's beef, it's wheat, it's increasingly... Uh, corn, soybeans, and then it's sorghum, which is more minor. Uh, but even up to, let's say, let's take a Democratic, um, the, the chair of the Senate, Demo uh, the chair of the Senate Ag Committee is Debbie Stabenow from Michigan. Well, it's blueberries, and it's apples, and it's dairy, and it's the sort of crops that you would imagine coming out of, uh, out of Michigan. Uh, the most protected uh, and incented crops in this, uh, in, in the country, sugar. Sugar is heavily incented. Uh, we would have lost the sugar industry to the Caribbean and South America decades ago, uh, but the southern states have a very powerful lock on making sure that, that sugar production is protected under these commodity programs. Well, when you start making it parochial and state by state, it gets harder to change things like the IRA. Because you're like, well, let's, can we adjust something in that commodity? Well, the Kansas senators want to protect wheat, so they are going to protect wheat. And Debbie Stabenow wants to protect blueberries and dairy and whatever else they grow in Michigan. And as long as everybody protects their crops in their own states, and don't mess with somebody else's state, then they all get along and it's very balanced. And so on one level that's great because it means we can pass a farm bill. On the other level it means that the farm bill rarely makes major changes and that's why the farm bill's the tortoise. And we can dream and we can hope and Jerry showed me that it wasn't sustainable sanctuary, I remember who it was. Uh, but let, you know, let's do something with the farm bill this year. Guess what, folks? Uh, I don't gamble, uh, but if I were a heavy gambler, I would not put any money on substantial changes in the farm bill. It, it, it ain't going to happen. Uh, 
uh, because this balance, once you combine the interest in nutrition with then parochial interest in commodities, it gets really, really hard to drive change. For example, Debbie Stabenow in the IRA got $20 billion designated for conservation elements in the farm bill. In USDA, she wants 20 billion, she has 20 billion. It's in there back in that giant list of things we were talking about. 20 billion is in the IRA for conservation elements on for the farm landscape. Uh, they're already fighting over that. It's supposed to go into EQIP, which is the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, which is here in the conservation slice. But the commodity groups are saying, well, you can't really spend that much money in the conservation slice that fast. We already have money there. People aren't taking advantage of the EQIP dollars. Why don't we put this over in the commodities section? Uh, but uh, Senator Stabenow is saying, no, I wanted that in conservation. So she'll probably get it in there, but it's not going to be the dramatic shifts that, that uh, those of us that care about the environment and, and exploring different ways of agriculture, it's not gonna look like that. It's gonna be more big payments for cover crops um, in the Corn Belt, I would guess, is, is what that's gonna end up looking like. So that's the Farm Bill discussion, and I hate to bring a really sad message if you came here hoping to find out how awesome the Farm Bill was gonna be. Uh, but it's going to look pretty close to what it looks like uh, before. The only reason it might look somewhat different is because if you think about uh, if you think about Congress as a as a uh, harbor with a lot of ships in it, and they're about to go out to sea, and you need to ship something to China, guess what? There's only one boat that's going to China, and so they may throw every single thing that you, they may want, they're gonna throw it onto this bill because that's the only one that's gonna pass. Uh, so it could look a little different, but not because we've made substantial changes in here. Uh, it's just gonna look different because people threw their pet project onto the bill because it was gonna pass. And that's the substantial difference between the IRA and, and the farm bill. Uh, that's it for me on prepared comments, uh, but I'm happy to take questions and, and even if you are sick of this and ready to go, you're, I am, uh, would not be offended. I'll hang out and talk to the people that aren't offended. So, uh, yes. Um, on your first part when you were talking about those seven or eight ideas that uh, we get incentives for, you know, well, you know, Moderna found out that when they got money from the federal government, that um, then the government, if something was developed, like a mm -hmm. product or a patent. So what's the deal on these? Will the government have uh, their finger in, in those patents that come up, or how will that work? That's a great question. So let, let's take hydrogen, for example. So the government is having a competition for hydrogen hubs. There are $8 billion available for those hubs. Uh, and there, were, there weren't necessarily rules on how you could organize the hub. They wanted different and distinct applications, but there is a group called HALO, Hydrogen, Arkansas, Louisiana, Oklahoma. And that is, so there are lots of different ways to produce hydrogen yeah. through electrolysis. So they, and they've given them color codes. So blue hydrogen is hydrogen that's come from fractionating natural gas. Green hydrogen is from renewable energies. Pink hydrogen is from, uh, or green is from wind and solar. Pink is from um, nuclear. I don't remember the color for hydro uh, going to hydrogen. Uh, but there's all these different colors. Well, halo is associated with uh, natural gas. And then there's one for, there's a, a hub suggested around Chicago that's going to be for over the road trucks because they're too big for electric batteries. So they've considered using hydrogen fuel cells to uh, power those. So and I'm sorry I'm going into this, but I'm explaining that in a way that if they, so these applications are all due on April 7th. If they are <coughs> successful, 
they get like $30 million <coughs> from the federal government to continue building even a more drilled down definitive plan for a hub. And then if they are selected to be one of the eight, each hub gets around a billion dollars. Billion with a B. Uh, and what would likely spin out of that is public investment uh, and then also private entities coming in and investing in uh, uh, building off of that infrastructure. And what the federal government was trying to do there was that when we moved to wind and solar, it was a, a free-for-all. So there, there was not a lot of development planning in that. Um, it just people, the, the market just sort of created itself and we've got wind farms all over the place and solar farms all over the place. And the hope is that they build structured systems so that it makes a little more sense. Yeah. Do you think the uh, new farm bill will try to incentivize uh, regenerative agriculture more? Uh, so the question was, is the new farm gonna incent regenerative agriculture more, uh, two responses. I think that's what Debbie Stabenow wants out of her $20 billion. Uh, but then I also think that in particular, regenerative agriculture is being defined and redefined as we speak. You know, what, what, does, what qualifies as regenerative agriculture? Um, and so I think that, um, uh, the Rodale Institute in Patagonia that were instrumental in, in initially defining regenerative agriculture uh, would not be pleased to find out that to the folks that are uh, running the farm bill, it's probably going to be more cover crops and and buffer strips, which are good, but it's not it's not the same. Uh, yeah. Well, um, when you started your talk about hydrogen. Um, and green hydrogen, I, I think you said, well, you know, green hydrogen would be made from excess solar and wind power. And then I think you said, but that could be used for other things. And I'm yeah, not so sure what those are. I, I don't know what they are. So I think the, the race is on to find ways to use. So when you have, like, let's say Evergy, Kansas City Power and Light and, and West Art. So Evergy, uh, Evergy system is maybe, uh, their peak load is seven or eight gigawatts of power. Uh, and peak load is usually hit on August 15th at 5 p.m. when it's super hot and everybody has their air conditioners on. So they have to have a system that can provide that kind of power at that point in time. Well, on April 15th, when it's 72 and nobody needs anything running, there's a lot of excess capacity for power. In the old <coughs> days when you had a coal plant, you'd shut it off. Uh, but it takes a long time for coal plants to ramp up and ramp down. There's just reasons why <coughs> wind and solar are much cheaper as an energy source. The problem is, what do you do? Like, they have the ability to produce power when you don't need it. So it's really wasting that energy to have that out there. And so hydrogen is one consideration. Battery storage was another one. Uh, but to be candid, they've had trouble making large scale battery storage work. Uh, and one element that I know that they've been trying is your car battery for your electric car has to operate at like 98% efficiency. Well, batteries over time go down. So once it hits like 80% efficiency, they'll take a bunch of those Tesla car batteries and they'll stack them up and use them in battery storage for a while. But even that isn't very efficient. Uh, I have heard, and I still don't understand this, I've heard of startup companies that have been exploring molten metal as a form of battery storage. Uh, all that being said, battery storage is expensive and it's not coming as fast as they want it to. And so they're looking for other industrial processes that don't have to run all the time. The kicker is they want to take advantage of that power when it's there and it's cheap. And you know, they, you, when you sort of can't give it away. And so is there a process that you can flick on and it runs when the power's there? And then the second we have winter storm Uri and everybody's freezing and we need all the power on the system, you can turn that, that uh, infrastructure off and you just don't use it. And hydrogen is one, but I think we're going to see a lot of different technological advances that are designed to do that. Yeah. I've heard of 
pressurizing salt mines. Yes. So one of the elements of Kansas's hydrogen application and what makes us unique is that we are using our salt, uh, uh, our abundant salt underground um, for a variety of reasons. We already use our salt to store natural gas. We have considerable natural gas storage in the, in the state of Kansas. Mm -hmm. You can also store hydrogen underneath there, but you can also pressurize any air underground when there's abundant electricity and then you've just got your turbine there and when you want that power back you just turn the air back on and it comes back up and where's the turbine and there's your power salt is an incredible storage <clears throat> vessel because if you apply a little amount of moisture to it it sort of seals itself off <laughs> and so they can make these salt domes and what they do is they take a mineral uh, a, a sort of special liquid solution, uh, drill down, brine out whatever size chamber they want in our salt, uh, uh, our salt stores, and then that becomes the storage vessel underground. And so um, not every, uh, you know, any state in the country can compete for over the road transportation in hydrogen. Not every state can compete for salt. And what makes us unique is that our salt band is very thick. And then it's fairly close to the surface around the center of the state of Kansas, where I actually happen to be from. Uh, the, we have the oldest salt mine operating in, in Ellsworth County, independent salt. But then you go into Rice County and Reno County, of course, or um, have other large salt mines. So we have a lot of salt. And it, um, if, you think of, if you think of Kansas west to east, uh, it emerges kind of right in the middle, and it goes downhill underground. You can't see this at all, but like it keeps getting deeper and deeper the further west you go, but it's there. And you can solution it out all you want and make great big storage domes underneath there. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Kansas geological history, salt domes can leak. Uh, and I think it was probably 20 years ago when the Yagi Field uh, had multiple leakages underneath Hutchinson, and um, it, imagine, you know, we're here in a church, so it's fun to talk about this. Imagine God being angry with the community. It is fires from the earth. I mean, the second those start coming up, uh, and then they catch on fire, it's really bad, because it's pressurized gas, lots of it underground coming up. Um, so you want to make sure that you get the geology right, obviously, uh, but... Um, on balance, salt domes make for incredible storage storage vessels. And that's one of the reasons Kansas's application for hydrogen is so strong. What are your thoughts on Biden's opening the oil fields in Alaska? The uh, question is, what are my thoughts on Biden's opening the oil fields in Alaska? I, so here, and this is this is just Josh Swatty talking. Um, I see oil reserves as some of our most valuable elements, mostly because um, I think oil is a really incredible substance, and it's got all sorts of amazing uses, some of which we don't even know yet. And I think that, of course, we can say this now, but I think 50 years from now, it's going to be looking back similar to, you know, we look back on the whalers uh, during Herman Melville's day, and we're like, oh my gosh, they almost killed all the whales just for oil. How crazy were they? We're going to, our great-grandkids are going to look back and they're like, oh my gosh, they took the most precious substance on earth and they just lit it on fire. <laughs> and, and so oil is, I, I tell this to people all the time, I anticipate that we, homo sapiens, will continue extracting oil from the ground a long time from now, but I expect it's going to be for purposes that we don't know yet. It's a really interesting substance. Uh, and it scares me when we go into a fairly pristine area and we're like, let's drill for it. Because, uh, one, we know there's a lot there. So 100 years from now, if it's really important, you'd hate to think that we went into an area where we know you can get at it and we took it all and we burned it. Um, it, it, it just, um, that's, my, that's my take on it. Um, it. It's disappointing to see. So, yeah. 
that gentleman's kind of touched on this question before, and I, I know that you've said that all of these expenditures and credits and everything are going to be funded by the IRS changes, or that's the plan. Yeah. But um, how, what, because I, I always struggled with economics, but <laughs> so what is the simple economic explanation for how those expenditures are designed to actually reduce inflation? Yeah, I can't tell you why they call it why they called it that at all. It's um, a really good sounding Yeah, a good sounding name. I, I thought that was strange, uh, but I also, to be candid, I don't know why the federal, law, like Kansas lawmakers, and you can, <coughs> however you want to feel about them, Kansas lawmakers have the decency to not name all of their bills. I think naming bills is goofy. The federal government, all of them, Name all their bills, and all of their bill names, in my humble opinion, are embarrassingly stupid. <laughs> and I, the Inflation Reduction Act, I don't, I don't know why they thought this is why it should be named. Okay. Um, uh, and and uh, at least it wasn't. I mean, most of them have like um, acrostic words associated with them, and they're usually terrible. Um, so that's yeah. sorry that that's my answer to that. But yeah, I don't know why they call it that. Right, okay. Yeah. Oh uh, yes. About the nutrition part of the farm bill, there's a growing recognition that it's kind of dangerous to rely on Central Valley of California for all these fruits and vegetables that are important in our diet. So what is the possibility <coughs> of getting more help to the small farmers who could? But the right subsidies could shift more than fruits and vegetables. I do think you are going to see a a shift in production um, driven largely by the availability of water. Uh, I think initially, for the question is, back to nutrition, how can we get more people greater access to fresh fruits and vegetables, which are, I mean, the data are abundantly clear. Those are great things that, to be eating. Um, I think initially what's going to happen is you'll see more grown in the Central Valley of California, but only because there is still a tremendous amount of alfalfa grown in the Central Valley of California. And alfalfa is a great long-term, multi-year legume that sets its own nitrogen, but it is thirsty. It's a very thirsty crop. And so as we start to, we globally, start to parcel out, well, where should we be growing certain crops? I can grow some fruits and vegetables on my farm in central Kansas, but it, it's tough. You know, we'll have late frosts, early freezes, drought, uh, high winds. It's difficult for me to grow certain fruits and vegetables in central Kansas. I can grow alfalfa. So I would imagine what we see in the next 10 years is those western states, Utah, Nevada, the Central Valley of California, those are still growing alfalfa. You're going to see alfalfa come back here. Uh, because the Central Valley is a magical place to grow certain high-end fruits and vegetables. And so they'll take whatever remaining water they have there, and they'll spend that uh, incredible soil and dependable climate in the Central Valley on those kinds of fruits and vegetables. In the meantime, and I'll get to the end, in the meantime, the Farm Bill does include incentives for uh, farmers to explore more fruits and vegetables that are available at the farmer's market scale, mm -hmm. but um, it is hard to build an incentive big enough. Uh, I mean, they're just, they're not moving the needle. Uh, the modern farm system mm -hmm. is, is static enough that that uh, I'm not sure what incentive would be necessary to take a traditional corn soybean farmer and have them say, I'm gonna stop doing this and running my half million dollar machinery that's easy, and I'm gonna go do, um, you know, let's say summer squash or something, which is incredibly labor intense, and you need huge numbers of people to do it. Uh, it it's hard to build an incentive that can get you there. Yeah. I'm, I'm, along the line of agriculture and agri land use for agriculture we should, to, it seems to me now is a good time to kind of reimagine how we're going to use land for agriculture and so just for example in western kansas you know it's uh, you know it's it, it's drought conditions right and so if it continues to be that dry pretty soon 
Western Kansas that look like Arizona. So you can't grow crops there anymore, but I guess you can put more wind farms and solar panels up, right? So, but that's not this. So the, I mean, the climate changes are changing agriculture yeah. in ways that we, I mean, we're still feeling right now, but that's one of the things I personally felt because we have a farm out in Western Kansas and five inches doesn't grow anything. It, it doesn't cut it, and then so that you all understand, it's actually it's <clears throat> it's worse than in Arizona because you're not only not getting the rain. I mean, the Southern Plains are can be the most inhospitable place to, to try to farm because you get 65 mile an hour winds, mm -hmm. and and if you've got wheat in the spring, they can it can kind of handle that. But I mean, no crop, no crop can handle sustained days and days and days of 65 mile an hour winds. It just punishes, it punishes everything. And so um, it's going, to, whereas like in Arizona, yeah, it's incredibly dry, but it's, uh, it, it's much milder from a wind perspective. Um, the Southern Plains could just be brutal. I mean, 10% uh, humidity with the sustained 65 mile an hour winds is just gonna beat the daylights out of any living thing that's tethered to the ground. Um, and it, it makes it hard and so um, that's why yeah I think you'll see continued expansion of, of wind power down there and then it makes a lot of sense for solar uh, in some of those landscapes um, which then allows farmers you know if you put up a section of solar then that income allows you to uh, not need so much coming out of um, out of your other ground that you're uh, that you're growing on um, yeah. No. So two questions, if I may. One is uh, on the individual incentives, the tax credits, that's all coming from the federal stuff and you fill that out in your tax form so there's no state involvement. But the rebates that are for moderate income and lower folks, that's money given from DOE to the states. And uh, you had how much Kansas was going to get, and they can take some off the top to administer that. So the first question is, do you have any insight into how Kansas is going to manage that those funds? And then the second question is kind of back to what, related to what Dan said, uh, do you hear much talk about agrivoltaics in Kansas, meaning combining the large utility scale solar fields with other compatible agricultural uses? Uh, the first question on the IIJA and the BIL, um, plus I think some of the rebate programs, we do have a, an infrastructure advisory team that was designed by the governor. It was headed by Julie Lorenz, the Secretary of Transportation. She's now left that position, so I'm not sure who's running that, but it's, it was supposed to serve as a gatekeeping, not state agency, but state organization to manage and disperse those funds. Because yeah, gigantic sums of money coming in, uh, and then they would, they would design the program to move them out. And whether that meant like saying, okay, Kansas Corporation Commission, you're gonna be the entity that handles these rebates for this program, which is likely where it would end up. Which, uh, which program? Uh, the for which for like these agency, the like, I mean, which agency the Kansas, the corporation commission oh uh, is but it, I mean there's really not any other place that would house it that has this they of, have no staff <laughs> they have exactly I mean there are real questions around how um, yeah that if you're familiar with this the Kansas Corporation Commission has an energy office but it's severely understaffed and so there are questions about how they could administer those programs, but I, nobody else really even has that expertise. So I would expect some of that to go there. And then I'm sorry, Bill, what was the second half? Agrivoltaics. Oh, so I mean, the thing about agrivoltaics is, is with any power source, the consumers want it as cheap as possible. So uh, right now, a solar developer is going to say, well, I'm going to build a solar project that's as cheap as possible, and I don't want to spend a lot on combining the two of them. Uh, I think by the end of the Inflation Reduction Act within the 10 years, we'll find better ways to um, kind of combine those two. If you have your panels up high enough, they do it in New York right now, um, largely for sheep or goats underneath. 
um, they can work pretty well. Uh, it's just like in Kansas, the devil's in the details. We have 65 mile an hour winds. The higher you go with, with great big flat panels, the more risk you have for wind damage. And so uh, we'll explore that. But I think uh, the initial big solar projects you see in this state are going to be pretty standard, uh, what we call commercial industrial solar. Yeah, and then I'll, I don't want to keep everybody here, so I'll, I'll, Jerry and Margaret get the last crack at this. Okay. Uh, I've read that there is or there needs to be a, tr uh, a trend toward smaller farms, back toward smaller farms, away from large industrial farms, that perhaps this new bill might help promote? So the question was, you know, can this promote back to smaller farms versus larger farms? Here is where, um, this is me stepping out on a limb and being kind of dangerous. I am a large proponent of the Wendell Berry Eyes on Acres. Everybody should have a, a, an area that you can really watch. But I'm also not immune to the value that large farms can bring. Um, they are typically your early adopters. Uh, and, and some of... I'll use Iowa as an example. We know on a small watershed basis the farms that are causing problems in those watersheds. And it's not, you know, you automatically want to say, well, it's the great big farms. Well, no, a lot of times it isn't. Uh, because if you spread your hog manure when the ground is frozen and then it rains, you're wasting it. And that's what clogs the rivers. And that's what kills everything in the Gulf of Mexico with the hypoxic zone. And the, the technologically advanced farmers, usually the big ones, know. They're like, we're not going to go out there and spread, spread our manure when the ground is frozen. It's the guy that's been doing that, it that way for the last 50 years, and nobody's going to tell him any different. And he goes out and he spreads his manure wrong. And so um, it... it I never thought, Jerry, had you talked to me 20 years ago, would I be advocating for great big farms? And I'm not necessarily advocating for great big farms, but I will say, in the last decade in particular, um, we have got to change the landscape quickly. And influencing big farms that are early adopters can make huge changes quickly on the landscape. I have a friend that farms in western Kansas. He farms 100,000 acres. Uh, he is a very forward-thinking, uh, uh, aggressive adopter of technology. If you can give him some climate technology that works, that improves his bottom line, he's going to adopt it, and then everybody around him is going to see that he adopted it, and they're going to turn right around and adopt it themselves. I never thought I would advocate for that sort of adoption, but there is value there uh, in terms of uh, the race we are on on a climate perspective. Uh, that doesn't take away from the value of small crops uh, and small operations, but I think I think it's pretty balanced. Yeah. Well, my question has to do with the race we are on. We are on, and I'm wondering in your travels and conversations, what is the sense of urgency in Kansas about climate change and the threats to the planet? Can you summarize what you have observed? In so I think um, I think farmers are cognizant of climate change. Uh, but I think the one thing that we have, we in this room working for us, is that uh, we are going to run out of water in the Ogallala. I mean, we are using it too quickly in the western third of the state, if you're familiar with that aquifer. And I would even argue that but for the Ogallala right now, we would be in the midst of a severe dust bowl. Because they didn't have access to the Ogallala in the 1930s when, when they went through this dry spell then. So we're seeing sustained drought and then periods of, of outrageous wind. There is soul-sucking wind in western Kansas. And these guys are pouring the water on to hold the ground together. And, and in many respects, it's doing it. If they didn't have the, the aquifer right now, 
it's already blowing terribly, but it would be infinitely worse. And I think that those farmers are realizing if we lose this water, uh, we are going to be, uh, you know, talking about land use change in Western Kansas, fundamental whole cloth abandonment of broad stretches of Western Kansas in terms of farming. So it's not necessarily a climate change discussion, but it is, I've always thought climate change was also part of a broader resource consumption. Like uh, we are consuming all of it too fast. We're consuming our carbon too fast. We're consuming our water too fast. We're, we are consuming our phosphorus too fast. Um, and I think that water has finally woken people up to the fact that we could have a real problem. We are seeing impacts downstream uh, because back to uh, all of the trickle down effects if you're using water in a center pivot in western Kansas the first thing that you would say is well I want to use it more efficiently I don't want to waste it well that's great except that in in Colorado you know they divert those streams onto your field and then 70 percent of it goes back into the stream because it's a very inefficient method of irrigating well, we are not that inefficient anymore. We're 85 to 90% efficient with our center pivots, which is awesome if you're growing corn. But what people don't realize is that rivers are generally waste systems. They move excess water off of a landscape. And if we are being brilliantly efficient with our aquifer water in Western Kansas, that means that there is far less moving downstream in my lifetime, which I still consider short, but I'm 43 now, in my lifetime, the Smoky Hill at Ellsworth, I would have never thought that it would stop flowing. I've seen it at four cubic feet per second, which is a very, that's a trickle, but I would never think that it could entirely stop. I worry about the Smoky uh, because we are getting nothing from Western Kansas. Uh, the sustained, alluvial flow that makes a river exist and you want to talk about ecological collapse uh, you know in a period of drought like this in Ellsworth all of our wildlife leaves my farm upstream and they go down to the river because they know there's water there and if if the river is not there then we've got real problems and I think that um, the people on the landscape the farmers uh, I think most of them acknowledge climate change now anyway, but I think they see they see stuff like the water as like, this is an immediate crisis. Because when you combine it with last December, December 15th, when we had that day of 90 mile per hour wind in western Kansas, just all day, and it wasn't a storm, it was just a day of 90 mile an hour wind, that's not normal. That is not, you know, my... My machine shed, when I bought it, it was rated for 90 mile an hour winds uh, because, you know, it's not going to survive a tornado, but it's like this will sustain, handle 90 mile an hour. Well, we had a day of 90 mile an hour winds, and you're sitting there like, is my whole building going to blow away? And it can survive one day, but can it do this like every two months? I mean, nobody has construction out there that can handle that. And... It's taking a real, it's taking a psychological toll on farmers because it's just, it, wind is awful. Uh, wind did, for those of you that are from Western Kansas, you know this. And my wife, who is from here, did not realize that we never ate outside. You just don't eat outside in Western Kansas. It's, it's not lovely. Uh, so, I, and that, I'll leave it at that, but I'll let Jerry have the last word. My dad told me he used to work for the Santa Fe Railway that stretches across all there you go. So anyway, thank you all. I'll stick around after the Well, I just want to thank you all for coming and thank you, Josh. That was uh, really uh, enlightening to kind of get the, the breakdown of all that to help us understand uh, our legislative process a little bit more. So